Yeah, so essentially I'm going to be talking about F2Pi and uh, what has changed. Many of you have, might have seen this last year. There was an introductory uh, talk on F2Pi. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be presenting this and a lot of this work is also done by my uh, colleagues at Quantsite Labs, Ralph, Melissa, Pierre, and Piero. Okay, so very briefly, who am I? Well, uh, I study at the University of Iceland and I'm funded by RANES, the Icelandic Research Fund, and also Quantsite Labs where I'm a software engineer. Okay, uh, and I'm very happy to be at Fortran Car and hence the logo. All the slides are on GitHub. Uh, you can take a look at them later. And also if anyone is into org mode, then they are uh, written org mode. So questions are welcome anytime. I do have the uh, Slack open on the side, but I'll probably bunch them a little bit. And I'm going to start with something which I wasn't really sure I should cover in the first place, but very quickly. So this was 15 years before I was born and it is from a book which I came across due to a recommendation on Twitter. But uh, yeah, I mean, apparently a few years ago or like some many years ago, people did not believe in machine independent programs. But, you know, as automated coding or compilation as we now know it got better and as languages became more standardized, this actually worked out all right. And nowadays we no longer really think about this very much. So this is closer to when I first came across compilers back when I was in high school. The standard being the contract between the compiler writer and the application developer, right? Which ensures this nice workflow that you go from code um, to compiler, to assembler, to linker, and then finally you load it and you execute it in memory, right? Excellent. Now, so far so good, but then when standards change, people have a lot of code bases which break and people get very upset. The best example is probably people who have code snippets which look like this, and they were using the Python 2 version and then they had to change to Python 3 and people are very upset. Right, and uh, this is little Fortran standard puzzle, which I'll get back to because I'm a little worried about time. So I'm going to skip these two slides and I'm going to go right into the bindings. So the story of Fortran and C in Python is actually not very complicated because in 2003, many years ago, we had the ISO C binding. And then in 2008, we got support for void. And then finally in 2018, we have support for things which don't have direct equivalence in C, right? And it's great. And in fact, Andre has the Fortran 90 best practices almost a decade ago, which talks about how you can then interface it to Python, right? which is essentially that you write good ISO C binding Fortran code, and then you can simply wrap it over to Python using Cython or the CFFI or C types, right? Okay, so where does F2Pi come into this whole thing? Well, F2Pi, and this timeline is important because F2Pi predates the ISO C bindings, which is really important to keep in mind throughout the rest of this. Okay, so it started out in 1999 when it was called FBIG, which was an interesting name, but we've dropped it. Okay, so, and then the context which we're going to be discussing is after 2007 when it moved into NumPy. And the reason is we're going to be, the reason why we care about this is because we get to use the NumPy C API, which allows us to write a lot nicer code than we could if we were just working with the Python C API. And it is used very much for a lot of large F77 projects. And um, a lot of them are actively developed. And its biggest user is actually SciPy. Once again, we, we can talk about that later. So how does F2Pi work really? So F2Pi takes your code base and then it creates a giant dictionary of uh, kinds and all of these things, almost like a parser that's done in Crack Fortran. Crack Fortran is also notable for being one of the few parts of F2Pi which is used outside of NumPy. It is used as part of um, Sphinx Fortran where it's used to essentially tokenize and uh, syntax highlight your code basically. Anyway, so there is an extension to Fortran which is uh, the definition is in uh, BNF format and it is available on the NumPy documentation side. It's called the PyF file. It is somewhat inspired in a sense by the Cython approach, right? But the important thing to note about F2Pi is that it rarely throws an error. If you're running F2Pi on your code base, you will almost never get an error. This does not mean it'll compile, it just means it won't throw an error. Uh, it's really a best effort sort of thing. And that's, uh, it's surprising to many users, but it's really the way it's designed because the idea is uh, you should be able to get some sort of uh, baseline wrapper and then you need to manually customize it. So because it's not a compiler, it can do something which your compiler cannot do, which is it can rewrite your code base for you. And I don't just mean in terms of optimizations, I mean in terms of what we think you might have been wanting to do, which is to say, if you did not use the ISOC bindings, then maybe we can rewrite that for you. And well, so first, how does it work? 
So here is a nice screen case example, which is very simple and shouldn't surprise anyone, including non-standard uh, usage of the star here. And it works. It works with this one magic command and we're done. That's F25, hooray. But, you know, really there are two things which are happening in this function call. This C here is actually offloading a lot to NumPy disk utils, which is a build system. So there's, okay, so up the magician's sleeve, we see life is not as nice as you'd expect. When you run it, sure, you get just one SO file, you get one extension module and you're done. But really quite a few things have happened, including the um, magic inclusion of these two files, Fortran object.c, Fortran object.h. These are actually shipped with NumPy. And of course, this is the wrapper file, this, this we expect to have. But these magic files, not, maybe not so much. And also, nowadays, built tools have come a long way. You know, one of the biggest differences between working back in 2000 and working in 2021 is that we have much better built tools. So while many years ago, the, the C flag was very important and NumPy disk utils was very important, nowadays we would prefer to interface more cleanly with like CMake or Mison and other things, which I'll get into. Okay, so complexity. Also, there's a problem with these files. They're not very human readable. So we started with a simple slide fitting subprogram, right? With one subroutine, and we got this massive set of generated files. This utils itself, well, it's typically used in the context of a setup.py, which is great if you're only working in Python. So, but nowadays we often want to wrap large code bases and then provide thin wrappers, but we have our own separate build system, right? So we want to get away from that. Okay, so what does a modern F2Py look like? Or what might it look like? Well, for one thing, we might want to have a nicer build system, right? We might want to use Mison. So I'm talking about Mison here mostly because, uh, because SciPy is moving towards Mison. There's a whole push for that. Anyway, so we can grab our includes very nicely from here. And we can build this simply as a direct extension module. Assuming we have the magic files as well. We, I'm going to talk about the magic files a little bit later. Now, if we want to ditch the magic files, then we'll go back to the standard decades old best practices approach, which is that we first rewrite our code using the ISOC bindings. And I also chose to ditch screen case because who likes to read that? Now, the only interesting thing which, uh, which is noted here perhaps is that I didn't want to really pass a single integer by reference. So I decided to give it value. And so what does it look like? What does your wrapper look like if you had to rewrite it from scratch today in 2021? Well, there's some boilerplate, of course there is, but the key things here is that we can include more than python.h, and this is where it becomes important to consider the NumPy context. And we can think about this in terms of universal functions, which are the building blocks of NumPy's functionality. This is a standard declaration, right? And here is where we actually expose it to NumPy. All of these arguments are used to define array broadcasting semantics and all of these things from the NumPy side. And this is very bad C code. I, sh I should really emphasize that. This is not very performance oriented. It's not even very, uh, it's not even very smart because as you can see, I, I pointlessly basically am just, yeah, anyway. But the important thing to note is all we have to do is call the standard function within this NumPy C um, scaffolding essentially, right? And then there's some more boilerplate. We need to define the Python module, right? And then finally at the end, I decided to call it Fibby for some reason. This is important. We can define what goes in, what comes out. And as you can imagine, when we start to work on characters or when we start to deal with more complicated systems or more complicated Fortran code, then this functionality is slightly better than what you get from Python C, which is great. So, and then finally, the initialization, where we define the pi in it. This is part of the extension module part and probably not very interesting to people here. OK, so compilation is uh, directly through Mison. We have dropped all magic modules, right? We are left with just an F90 file and uh, a nice C file, which is only 85 lines compared to the 1,600 lines of the previous example. and. Um, it works. It works exactly the way the handcrafted F2Py, I mean, the automated F2Py works. It works exactly the way users expect, and we get a whole lot of functionality of it.
Okay, there is a pointless benchmark because there always is. It is pointless because uh, these numbers have no meaning. Also because I'm essentially only checking the speed of loading things into, it, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is the fact that there are other ways to deal with this. You can actually call, as I mentioned, f 2 pi uh, has, okay, maybe I didn't mention this before. f 2 pi has partial support for F90, which is of course we handle lowercase and we also handle modules. We don't handle derived types yet, mostly because we, we are not ISOC compliant yet. Okay, I mean, ISOC binding compliant. Of all of these, the only thing I would say is don't use C types, but Cython works. It generates something like 6,000 lines of code of intermediate, but um, you may or may not already have a lot of Cython code floating around, so you may not care that much. Okay, conclusions. So how do we get to this magic F2Pi, which is going to work in the manner which I described? Well, for one thing, we need tests. We need to rewrite and update our test suit. Currently, our test suit is actually SciPy. When we make a comment, if it breaks SciPy, then we go back and take a look at it, which is, I mean, it's pragmatic, but maybe not the best approach, yeah? And then finally, we want to actually rewrite all our C wrappers. We want to rewrite our C wrappers to use these newer standards, to also use the new ufunc functionality, which, which has improved vastly. So when F2Pi was first being written, this was more, there was still numeric and there were all these other things going on out there. Nowadays, we have a better handle on this and that's the way we're gonna go. And, you know, build tool support, which is going to drop the whole C flag thing or make it proxy over to Mison or CMake or something like that. We will be implementing the newer standards, but really once we become uh, ISOC binding compliant, it becomes sort of a non-issue. And so instead we can actually start working on automating guarantees which you might expect from your code. And then of course there's documentation, better infrastructure with NumPy, because a lot of people, if you ask them, does NumPy have Fortran? They will tell you no, because uh, NumPy has a whole ecosystem of NumPy enhancement proposals and other things, none of which mention F2Pi. F2Pi is sort of like in this dark corner of NumPy. And yesterday you saw a nicer way of having an intermediate between your tokenized stream and your final compiled code, right? Uh, which Andre presented, the abstract semantic representation. And in the long run, you know, maybe 10, 15 years later, once L Fortran is well-defined and works everywhere and um, is, you know, once we have guarantees from that, we might simply transition away from crack Fortran. We don't necessarily need to keep crack Fortran around, which is also why I didn't talk about it too much. And finally, in the last few minutes, who cares? Well, honestly, every applied user of Fortran cares because even though the Fortran standard is light, it is much lighter than the C++ standard. It's only 600 pages. It's like, it's like a beach read almost. Still, no one typically likes going through it for some reason. So, and a lot of the users of Fortran prefer writing things which just work. So that's where F2Pi comes in. Now it just works and it also works at NumPy. And that's the end really for me. And uh, here are some acknowledgements. This is my advisor, Professor Hannes Janssen. I also have a co-supervisor, Bilder, Professor Bilder, and uh, Dr. Elvar and Andre, who's helped so much, and my colleagues at uh, Quantside. I see I have a minute and 30 seconds left, so I might as well go. Oh, there's a video. You, you did great. Thank you very much. And <laughs> there we have plenty of time for questions. So we we'll start with people asking directly. So just unmute you, yourself, if there any. Well, people are thinking. In the meantime, we'll just go to see some questions coming from the chat. So Tiziano, he was very active in this kind of things. So the first question, have you, I think it's a kind of comparison to F parser. Have you made any? So, so you said it was started as a fork, so Tiziano. Uh, so um, the F2Pi Fortran parser is something which, as I mentioned, which we really want to move away from because the problem is you can't really parse correctly. You can't correctly parse Fortran unless you're you're going to provide a compilation guarantee, which is to say, which is why the ASR is sort of the intermediate which L Fortran uses. If if you just want to analyze the syntax and then come up with rules, you can do that in many ways for sure but it's never going to be as exact as providing a guarantee that this compiles and runs. So that's why in the long run, we're hoping to move completely away from having the parser built in to F2Pi. Okay. okay. Any other so, question? So I think I missed it. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the question always about, about parsing to generate bindings is, 
do you really need a parser which is fully able to parse Fortran or do you just need a good enough parser to just generate the binding? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Why, why do you think we need, we actually need a full parser which understands full Fortran? Because if we have a full parser which understands full Fortran, we can better understand which parts of the code. So suppose we want to replace uh, a whole bunch of kind, kind variables, kind selectors, whatever, whatever they're called, with the equivalent ISOC binding thing. For that, we might want to know whether that's a narrowing conversion or something like that, which is something which... So, okay, it, it becomes more complicated when you have things which are deferred length and all of these things, right? So then you need to you need to have more of a global understanding of what that program is going to be used for, right? And at that stage, when you want to deal with larger code bases, then this, this problem crops up more and more. It's, so one of the issues which I see a lot in like wrapper generation is typically that the thought is you have one subroutine which will call a whole bunch of other Fortran things and you just wrap one subroutine. But you know, the long-term goal of F2Pi is really that you have a full Fortran project and you're able to wrap it so that you get every function from there automatically. So you, you don't need to know, you no longer need to sort of massage it into this wrapper friendly subroutine or functions. I see, but the, the, the problem is, so what about the, the object lifetimes? I mean, just having the functions is not enough usually. I mean, um, we, we've seen that yesterday with allocating objects somewhere. And we, we just had kind of like this feature added to be able to allocate them somewhere else. But it's still, I think, rather complicated if you just, so, I mean, we also had this idea for our code where we could kind of like use Python as a, as a scripting tool to basically glue together the workflow for our different functions. Mm -hmm. but, the problem there is always, okay, what, what do you do about, about lifetime of objects where to allocate them? And even if we would have those bindings, we would still have to kind of like ensure that, that this is basically maintained. And also that the, the data layout of the different things is not really, does not transport well from one language to the other. Hence, I'm, I, I see when you get more complex things that you want a full Fortran parser, because at some point you will get things you could not otherwise understand to generate the interface. On the other hand, uh, I, yeah. But Still. like even for object lifetimes, if you have the whole symbol table, then don't you already know the lifetimes in a sense as well? Like at least you have an understanding of which, uh, of how they're interconnected which is what the ASR provides actually. So there's actually, well, I'll be giving a small talk on the ASR in the mini symposium, which will maybe talk about this a little bit more, but yeah. I guess there are people more qualified than, than me to answer that, but uh, Fortran also has a runtime system behind. You see that the latest when you do IO, that for example, um, the scripters are not synchronized between the C binding and the Fortran side. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can't in all cases guarantee that, that you have this. So the simple table in that sense, I would argue is not enough to guarantee this because there is always kind of like something behind. I mean, Fortran does not have a garbage collector but uh, other languages have. So this would be the, the extreme case. Um, so yeah. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point. I will have to think about this a bit more. <laughs> so the, the problem is, you know, I just joined with the F2Pi project two weeks ago and it's it's big. So yeah. But definitely yeah. in the long run, this is a problem which we need to think about for sure. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And let's see if there are other questions coming. I don't know. So, yeah, oh, uh, yes, right, right. Uh, so the answer to that is kind of simple. Uh, once we actually stop generating these files and working through them, once we, 
So the real reason why we don't support derived types is because right now our wrappers and our object functionality comes from these two files. When we get rid of them and when we start creating just a standard binding, ISO C binding compatible. So what we're planning to do is sort of create an intermediate stage where whatever Fortran code has been written gets rewritten into Fortran code with the ISO C binding. And at that point, really, it's uh, well defined, right? Because this the derived types are defined to be interoperable with structs in C. So when when you actually write it out as a as a as something by hand, then you don't even worry about whether or not it's a derived type. And yeah. it's mostly the same for the newer features as well, the other features as well. Yeah. yeah. I must admit that this is, I, I do spend a lot of time on these kind of things, you know, writing by hand for those derived types. So there you have to read this because it's very long. It would take me a minute to read. So in the interest of time, maybe we can go to the next presentation and you can reply in the chat. So thank you very much.